he searched the whole code base. The only place where they are using blockchain is marketing material. Oh, that's how I kind of feel about it too. Anybody want pizza? Anybody want pizza? Welcome back to the stream. I haven't eaten yet, so I brought pizza. And I thought I can show you how to cut pizza the right way. Because I believe a lot of people use the absolutely wrong tools to cut pizza. So, let me show you how to properly cut pizza. The wrong tool people use is a pizza cutter. That's a special uh, tool that the industry just created to uh, make you spend more money. Uh, it's, 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 it doesn't really exist. It's just a fake product. Uh, uh, it's, it's a whole conspiracy uh, just to make money. The best tool to actually cut pizza is of course scissors. At Narek, you know what's gone, what's, uh, what's on. So, uh, getting, uh, cutting the pizza like this, so much easier. So much simpler. And if you look at like, if you go into like a pizza restaurant and you see them using like the pizza cutter, uh, don't be fooled, they are all paid by the industry. It's all one big conglomerate. They're, like there are no independent small uh, pizza restaurants. It's all big chains and disguised under different names and they get orders from the top. Okay, welcome back to the stream. <laughs> this feels just wrong. You have no clue, scissors are the best way to cut pizza. No doubt about it. And you don't need to clutter your kitchen with another single use tool. Uh, it's just it's it's just so much better on so many levels. So yeah, I haven't eaten yet. I excuse myself already uh, for having to eat on stream, but I also didn't want to wait longer with streaming. So you know, gotta optimize my time here. So you have to endure me eating, but I guess I will do this while we like watch the videos and stuff like this. So <clears throat> like every stream, you know, I've been spending money, as you know, every day on just slightly improving the stream and improving my setup as you have seen uh, and so today I got another LED panel that is now hanging here in the top you don't see it it's attached to the arm where this overhead camera is attached to to light up uh, this this area here and I think it makes uh, the camera generally look better I is I'm already thinking so. yeah the FLIR works now uh, maybe I guess I can show you the current progress where we are at while I, w while we also use the Fleur. So um, I got an exchange unit or like I gave, I returned the one and ordered a new one and this one so far has been working, okay? So quite happy about this. So let me show you. Uh, I have here uh, this white thing that you see here attached. This is my phone and this here is the Fleur camera. This is attached to this whole setup here uh, with like an attachment arm. Man, it's fun to spend uh, the money on stuff like this right now. Okay, so let me turn on uh, th this screen here. And I guess uh, we switch to the uh, overview right now here. So there you can see uh, the floor camera. And when I now turn on the power of our setup here, uh, you can uh, slowly see how the chips that are driving those LEDs are uh, slowly uh, heating up. So up here, this here is the Oh, is it working? Ah, crap, the streaming isn't working. Wait, why is it not working? Ah, oh, fail. 
Oh, what a bummer. Now you don't see it heat up. Uh, I mean, we will uh, probably the stream is just uh, effed up for a moment. Uh, oh, we need to reset the wires, of course. That's what happens when you cut. Yeah, I'm sure that's punishment. I told you it's a conspiracy. You know, they are on to me right now. But it doesn't perform any traffic. I wonder, did it get a different IP? Okay, maybe I just restart this phone. Since when does Twitch use this graphics when stream breaks? Uh, oh. Are we back? I think we are back. Audio is shit. Um, test, test. Is the audio better now? Oh, the audio seems to fix again. Oh my gosh. Uh, Dalray, thanks so much for the... Okay, so thanks so much for the raid. We just had massive streaming issues. My stream broke. Then the audio was scuffed. And we were, I was just coming back and then you raided the stream. Uh, so uh, thanks so much uh, and everybody else, sorry for the, for the issues. But now it should be fine, right? We are good? Yeah, one more try. Are you going to try pipelining at all? No, I'm not going to try pipelining. But uh, if you search on YouTube, there is some, uh, somebody who uh, takes this a whole step further and has implemented pipelining. Will you stream the CTF? No, no, you, you don't stream the CTF because, you know, it's a competition. And uh, you can't stream, like, my solutions. I mean, if I saw something, that uh, that's a no-go. Of course not. Uh, on Saturday, I will also probably be on the Blind Hackers uh, Twitch channel for, for, like, an hour or so. He does, like, a charity stream, so I will be on there. Um, I will post that also on Twitter and stuff like this in case you're interested in that. And, by the way... Please make me stop saying stuff like this. I keep editing my uh, Twitch like stream highlights kind of thing, and I say this all the time, and it's it's so bad. Would doing CTF with chat be considered cheating? They're not really, but why would you do that? Like, I mean, it you kind of just ruin the competition in that case because everybody can join, and so uh, you know, like those teams. It's a competition between teams. It doesn't matter how big those teams are. There are actually massive teams at like universities. Sometimes there could be like dozens or maybe more students playing. Um, there's no like restriction like this. Could also could never be enforced, of course. This is just like the nature of the internet. We have to accept that. But we don't need to... Uh, we don't need to like... Not abuse. Abuse is the wrong term. But we don't need to do that. Um, of course. Oh, I was just confused why Ben Eater has here more connections than I have. And I just realized that these uh, inputs to this chip obviously have to be mirrored to the same chip over here. Ah, crap. Overhead. So I just wondered why he has here more wires than I have. And uh, these inputs that go into this chip obviously have to also go into the second chip here. They are the same chip and these are, I believe they are the address lines. So I believe these four wires decide to which address, I mean this is the RAM, right? To which address you read or write from. And so uh, um, the way how it works is you have four bit for that address stored here and four bits for the address uh, stored here. So um, together they are then 8 bit um, a byte and so uh, you need to mirror these so we need to make uh, these wire connections here right now but also let me pull up the schematic again of this chip just to be sure that this is exactly what we are connecting so this is Ben Eater's website um, so you can find here his whole thing usually when I buy laptops I always buy them with a, a Preferably like a, a like a British keyboard, or it's called US International keyboard, uh, and sometimes just the US keyboard, but <laughs> never the German keyboard. It's awful. But I didn't buy this laptop myself, so no, I have to live with that. Do you compare the prices from Reichelt and Conrad? Do you know what is cheaper? Uh, absolutely not. To be honest, I don't really care about it. 
um, it's it's just like at this point I don't care about it when I was younger I definitely cared about it because I didn't have uh, enough money but uh, you know like like a one or two euros more don't really matter to me anymore uh, I would also still think that most developers still use German keyboards but um, the German keyboard uh, doesn't have easy access to like the brackets or the parentheses or the angle brackets and stuff like this or or even the the quotes like you have to do shift 2 to get to the quotes while on a, a US or a English UK keyboard you have it um, it's just just like a normal like button on the keyboard and you don't have to read it, it's just a better layout for programming I think uh, I don't really care about umlauts because I never write German uh, but if I write German so I mainly work on my Mac so on the Mac you can do like option U then you get the dots and then you press the key that you want for the umlaut or option S you get a you know a special S so that's fine I actually have no clue how to do that on the ThinkPad here uh, I wouldn't I know don't know it on other keyboards but I, like I said I don't really care because I never write in German how can you win a ThinkPad you win it in a competition like <laughs> <laughs> how do you win a thing? Like, how do you win anything? You have to be part of some kind of competition or something to win something. And then sometimes there are prizes like that. You know, I, d I don't know how to respond to that. Did you get the RAM chips at Reichelt? <sighs> uh, if you ask me this because you didn't find it, then probably not. I ordered one chip on eBay from China. And I forgot which one it was. It might have been this uh, RAM chip. I, I don't remember. I don't even know what kind of characters you are typing. Both my Linux and my Mac and my Windows don't have this character. It's just a box. Or were you literally typing a box? I don't know. I, it looks like it's a character. My font doesn't have it. Oh, there were just brackets. Oh, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Square brackets. God damn it. Oh, I'm so hungry. Um, did you find interesting to code? Why you prefer security over programming? Uh, I think programming is very much part of my security work. I write scripts all the time uh, and r have like programming projects. I've been programming on stream even here. Uh, I started making a website again. And uh, I have been like programming is how I started. I I, I love to program at home as like a teenager and went to study uh, computer science at university because I wanted to become a developer. I just happened then to stumble into security. So, yeah. And to be honest with you, I still see my future could be be a programmer. Like this is not something I don't want to be. Um, I actually prefer being a programmer over being like a consultant who has to travel all the time because a lot of security jobs are like where you have to uh, like travel to clients all the time and doing consultant work and that is not like I don't want to work like that so uh, my alternative to that world would be to just be a programmer again this is wrong there's only one a zero line I'm such an idiot what the hell what am I doing so my alternative is definitely being a programmer. Did you try to apply for full-time jobs at company like Facebook, Google, uh, V8 team is now in Munich? Cool. Uh, not really when I, I, s I only applied like to jobs once and that was during when I was still my bachelor's degree. So this was not even when I, I, I just got barely into security like casually with CTS during that time. So I wasn't very well experienced yet. And I applied to like some other company for web development. Uh, I didn't, and actually I was, I, I tried out the Google interview also once, but I uh, failed already the first telephone interview. I still remember the one, like the one question that just blew me away, what kind of stuff they want to know. And since then I've been like paid attention to like learning everything basically. So on this telephone interview, they asked me, what is the Linux syscall that returns the most information or the most data or so about a file descriptor or file, file descriptor. I forgot which one it was. So what is it? What syscall? <laughs> Just Google it. That's the answer. Yeah. What's this call? Um, 
returns the most information about a file or file descriptor. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bang Pao got this got this job. Yeah. Now I know that. Since then I know that. <laughs> uh, back then I thought, holy shit, they are asking me about syscalls. I barely know about open. Like, how the heck am I supposed to know other syscalls? Like, what is this? Yeah. So that kind of blew me away. What they want to know. And so, uh, yeah, so obviously I failed that, but uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, libc obviously is wrapping, uh, this is called the same with like open and write and all these things are obviously uh, wrapped by libc, but end up as a syscall. Uh, they, they are pretty much, you know, they're just a wrapper, but, but they reflect the underlying syscall. Uh, the role was the site reliability engineer, which is a pretty tough position as far as I know, too. But it sounds like an amazing kind of jobs, um, SRE. There's even the SRE book. I always wanted to read it. Um, that sounds like an amazing resource, but I still haven't gotten around to reading this. It's like on my to-do list. It's for free. Uh, you should check it out, site reliability engineer. Uh, members of the SRE team explain how they uh, how their engagement with the entire software lifecycle has enabled Google to build, deploy, monitor, and maintain some of the largest software systems in the world. Like that kind of book sounds just like the the most amazing information. But I'm bad at reading books, so I'm sometimes quite surprised what kind of syscalls exist. Like when you look into like a syscall table for Linux. I got pizza over my laptop. I, I I find like the first time I looked at a syscall table, I thought it's really fascinating. Mm, because we always talk about like user land and kernel and to like look at what the actual syscalls are. So what the kernel provides us with functionality that then uh, you, the user land can use to build up whatever we want. Uh, so I find this quite interesting to look into what does the underlying operating system uh, deem important for user land to have as a you know um, as a as a function to to use. So uh, so looking then through these syscalls, I find like very like kind of eye opening or fascinating in some way. And yeah, and there's like a lot of stuff I've never like heard about, like what the heck is Schmatt IPC? So something about inter-process communication. So what is Schmatt? Okay, whatever. I don't know what it is. Oh wait, I have added wires. Yeah, I did. I added four. Uh, I have never looked at risk V, so I have no clue. Um, but I mean, um, in terms of opinions, I don't know. Like it's it's good that we have like open architecture and then people are experimenting with different architecture. That's always good. I think. I don't know. I think there is a code review uh, stack exchange page. Uh, I think stack exchange code. Ah crap. Stack. What the fuck is wrong with my keyboard? Stack exchange. Yeah, there's a code review stack exchange. So uh, there you can always post your code and have people review it. You don't want assembly programming. I think assembly programming might make more fun when you try to write shell code for an exploit. Then you have like some cool motivation about it, I think. So maybe look into that. So these are the, these are the da eight data inputs. Uh, now to the memory. So we've got our address lines, which we, I'm going to hook pin three on both of these chips together. Uh, so we need that too. What's the big <laughs> tool for cutting the wire? It's not for cutting wire, it's a wire stripper. Uh, uh, there's currently the first episode about the wire stripper uh, epic story epic story on my Life Overflow 2 YouTube channel uh, if you want to learn more about what it took uh, to get here. Okay, so uh, let me get, I guess, this kind of out of the way. Wow, did it, oh wow, it's warm under here. It heated up also below it. 
this is where the air couldn't like cool it so well so now so I mean they warm up but when you look at the temperature scale on the side the maximum temperature it measures right now on here is like 34 so uh, I mean that's perfectly fine um, I would be worried if that number would you know climb up to like 40 might also still be fine but like if it would climb much higher than that then I would worry no worries, the ASMR stuff will come on Live Overflow too. <laughs> I was thinking of starting this project too, but I don't have any of the uh, big tools. Probably will just use scissors that I use to cut pizza. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. Good idea. Mm, I just noticed something. He was talking about the LEDs glowing randomly. And when I turn on the power, uh, ah crap, now I guess I want to go back to this. So you just turn it on and you, you heard the audio. There wasn't really anything. Thing. So I looked here. Now let me I know, turn off these lights for a moment. Do you see that? Like they are very faintly on. And these are off. But they shouldn't be so faintly on. That doesn't make any sense. They should be... Like we have connected the stuff also like over here and they like not necessarily the same chips but they were a lot brighter. So I feel like something is not correctly connected here and that's why it gets like kind of like some, some I don't know if that's a correct term, like some, some phantom power. Like um, these ICs are internally connected so even if stuff is not co correctly connected there might still be current like through some resistor can still flow through or whatever it's on zero that's fine and after that we have out out zero and out zero goes after that we have data out again which also goes to this chip and then we have however the most mistake I would assume with the with the uh, inverter chips because these LEDs are basically connected to the output of the inverter chips so uh, I assume here to have the most likely uh, mistake Oh hey, Lana looks. Uh, are you streaming or done streaming or something? How did it go? Uh, I guess you will start soon, maybe. When you were showing the thermal camera, the NOT gates were not warming up. That is a good point, even though they were theoretically driving the LEDs. Yeah, so welcome, uh, Lana looks. Uh, she is doing game development streaming. Has been recommended to host uh, by somebody before here on the stream, so uh, we have hosted her before. Looks like a really cool game. And uh, game dev has, al has always also something been that I kind of wanted to get into at some point, but it's so much work, like especially when you also get into the modeling of everything, which you do yourself, or uh, I've seen you uh, work on some of the models. That is, that is crazy. I spent like, like one or two months ago, I felt like motivated to also get into uh, uh, game development a little bit just to f try it out just to f get an idea of what it is even about uh, because I've never done it before and then I, I tried out uh, Unity and um, I spent like really like a week almost every day on it and I have nothing to show for it like that was clearly not enough to get anywhere useful with anything yeah uh, so let's see if we connected the inverters correctly so I've put the schematic of the inverter here on the uh, screen in the top left so that's definitely connected they are both definitely connected to VCC and then GND is the bottom oh at least this chip here see where ground is connected to it's connected to nothing so this is connecting this line here and the chip is right here. So we are off by one here. Okay, so we fixed that. Okay, but yeah, so off is fine, right? So maybe it's also just like now all zero. Let's change some of these addresses. Oh, something is sliding up. Okay, so see now they are like properly like on. These are the data input pins. They are all connected to ground. So they are all zero and this is the this up here, this is the write enable. So if we enable write, we should write to this address a zero. Seems to have worked. Now all now I disabled the writing again and now they are all off. And now if we should like switch like to a different address now, 
like this is a different random address with data in with random data in there. If we go back to that address, yep, they are all off. Let's write in here, like that's let's, let's put these two on high. And let's put the other two on high. So let's see. So I enable input. Cool. Okay. Wait, that's weird. Um. Oh, never mind. Never mind. The data was. No, wait. Uh, what? Oh, they are reversed. So they all work fine. They are just a little bit twisted. I could change the order of the data jumpers. Yes. So I'm. That is one thing I'm considering. So now is the question: How do we deal with this? We could just say, like, we could just ex change here the the. We can turn them around. Let's see again the the data chip. So right now, so D zero. So this so this is for example zero. Zero is here all the way to the right. How does this happen? So let's just want to quickly understand why I did this mistake. I thought I did it all correct. So this is zero. I don't understand why I like connected them exactly the other way around. Well, it's fine, I guess. Uh, it's not. Like it's totally fine. Like I don't have to be that kind of annoyed by it. But yeah, I can shuffle the bits around for added security. Yeah, we obfuscate on the hardware level to make uh, reverse engineers hate us. And since the memory address is just four bits, we can we can use the seventy four LS once. Actually, we have more registers than I thought. I thought we only have these two registers plus the instruction register, but now I hear that we also have an address register. I didn't know. Or we want to be... Whoa. Thanks, Marentheus, for to fight off the sellout hacker again. I'm so glad he took over the stream again. Just when I was going to get my box cutter to cut uh, the the breadboard, uh, he struck he struck striked again he struck again and took over the stream. Thanks everybody for helping fight against him. What was that? Well, that was like a guy that keeps terrorizing me uh, with my Twitch. He somehow got access to my Twitch key, so sometimes he starts like streaming in between, and his uh, his handle is sellout hacker. How do we fight against him if we solve those hackers? Well, he's not the smartest. That's why we always beat him. I'm not able to really read and hex all values, but from like experience, there are a lot of hex values that I can recognize. For example, the numbers are easy. Uh, this is a zero. This is a one. This is a two. And it's like, you know, that, that simple. For one, for two, for three. And uh, if you want uh, the lower case, then you have to add hex to zero to it. Like space is hex to zero, and if you add space basically to the capital letter, you get the lower case. 2f is also often the case because you might encode it for like URL encoded for certain things. So that's also. Okay, so now I've got our outputs hooked up to our address line inputs. Did Ben either edit in the fast forward part like motor racing sounds? Did I hear this correct? Okay. Is that racing sounds? Okay. <laughs> I know. Okay, so now I've got our outputs hooked up to our address line inputs of our memory. So let's go ahead and power this back up again for our, our memory section. Excellent. Okay, that was a long video, 20 minutes. So sorry about that uh, boring video watching time. But uh, so now we can start uh, doing that the same. And yeah, welcome to everybody who just stumbled in. Uh, nice blade dancer. I'm glad that you found the stream in the just chatting category. 
This also explains why I am in the just chatting category. Not only are we incredibly slow and inefficient, and we uh, basically that's why we have the wires command. This will show you how many wires we have added in the past, like since the stream started. As you can see, we basically do don't do anything uh, on the stream besides chatting, and uh, we are clearly more fitting for the just chatting category than uh, for actually doing some some technology here. So uh, to answer that question, you stop because of the cost. Ah, that's a bummer. I can't spend a hundred dollars for a non-functional computer. <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Now we actually do maybe some science and technology. We gotta be careful with our wire rate that is coming up now, otherwise we might get kicked out of just chatting. Yeah, it is a little bit different, to, uh, difficult to write a compiler just because there's so limited space, right? And there will not even be a stack pointer register or something like this. So it's like very, very limited, the original implementation of this computer, but definitely something we could extend. And then, yeah, something like that would kind of also be also be fun. At least writing like an assembler or something. Or this assembler and this assembler would probably be useful. I think this is a great project to get into electronics. I mean, so I would say it could be a bit high risk in terms of cost if you don't like it in the end. If, if you buy all this and then you realize after the first like eight hours or so, uh, I really lose interest already, then maybe I would be careful with that. But if you already know that you kind of like electronics already and you just want to like step one further. So maybe if you are not sure if you like electronics, maybe a simple Arduino starter kit would be a good thing anyway. You might need an Arduino later for this build like there's uh, been either used an Arduino to automatically program the EEPROM or something. So you need that Arduino later for this build or can use this Arduino later for this build anyway. And getting like an Arduino and a breadboard and some jumper wires and some LEDs or, or like there are these Arduino starter kits with just a couple of things inside and try out a couple of these applications to first see if you like it before you spend like $250 or even more for like a multimeter and whatever else you still want maybe that's a uh, maybe a less cost risky attempt but if you already like if you already know it it's kind of fun and you are ready to for for a project that will take you like weeks or months maybe depending on how often you get to work on it then uh, yeah i think this is an amazing project to learn more about electronics could you hard code all possible programs that fit into that computer into a compiler that is actually a pretty funny idea. It's still 16 bytes is uh, a bit much, but we also have to consider that it's 16 bytes with a limited instruction set. So it's not quite the number that you have calculated, Spiritman. It We will have a limited amount of available instructions that we have. And so that would actually be really interesting if that becomes feasible it's probably still a too big of a number, but it's 16 bytes of RAM that is used for program and the program memory. And especially if you have a, like an intelligent brute forcer, then you can already like discard a lot of uh, attempts. Like you can already have some heuristics when you are generating those brute forcing programs that throw away any programs that would like crash or be invalid in a way anyway. So for example, anything that starts with a halt instruction you can like throw away so you already you know basically you are only brute forcing 15 bytes at this point um things like this like there are some thoughts you could have about that but yeah i like that i, I really kind of want to i'm really curious how many instructions this uh or like how many possible byte values for instructions this computer actually will have in the end because that seems kind of kind of cool not trying to solve the halting problem, just throwing out the obvious things that will halt. By the way, who's playing the Google CTF uh, this weekend? I think it starts tomorrow. I, I definitely plan to play, but I don't know how much time I have because on Sunday I have to release my next video. On, like, on, on Saturday I will be streaming and, and I still have to prepare that stream on uh, for, for the Blind Hackers uh, charity stream 
and um, uh, yeah, I have a lot of other small stuff to do. And I kind of also want to continue this build. This is really fun. I kind of want to continue this too. So, so maybe I, I take like a little bit of a break of the CTF to uh, to stream. So I might not play it com extremely seriously. We will. S I, I'm not sure yet. But how about we all look at least at a couple of challenges or like one challenge or so. And then we can, when the CTF is over on like Sunday or Monday, we can talk a little bit about the challenges. We can together, like if, if you if you didn't solve something and you tried to read some write-ups and you didn't understand them, then we can kind of like look at them together uh, and can see if we can together try to understand them. Stuff like this. I think it would be kind of fun. Uh, we can't play CTS on stream because they are ongoing competitions. So then we need a ground connection to a couple of things. We need one, two, three, four, five, uh, three, six, seven. Twitch plays Pokemon was such a great idea. It was so amazing. Yeah, I do find the Ethereum virtual machine very interesting though. I agree. I also think it's interesting, right? It's basically the same reason why I built an 8-bit computer. It's not that this is somehow useful or I think this 8-bit computer is revolutionizing the world or anything like this. The This is just an interesting computer, an interesting machine, an interesting execution environment. In the same way I find smart contract virtual machines um, equally weird and unique and fun to explore. They are just different from normal programs and I find this really interesting and fun. Uh, but I'm not interested in any like kind of investment or I also don't really see, see a lot of n usages for public blockchain applications but uh, you know that's for other people to kind of figure out. Um, Crap, I made one too much. Crap, I kind of lost track. I think I need to press once more, right? At least. Blockchains have utility. Yeah, sure, they have some utility. I mean, in the end, it's a technical solution for something. Um, it's a tool that you can use for whatever you want to solve. Um, you know, it's it's it doesn't it's it's neither good nor bad. It's just a tool. Uh, the question is, if you apply this tool, then well or not. You know, there are a lot of different database implementations, for example, and you can't say that one database is always better than the other one. They all have slightly, slightly different use cases and you use the one that uh, is the most appropriate for your use case and the problems that you have to solve. And so blockchains and smart contract systems and whatever are just technical solutions that you can use for something and again the question is just uh, is that in the most in a lot of cases it's unfortunately used as such a buzzword that it's just like put into everything that doesn't need to have it but I'm sh you know, that doesn't discredit all the cases where it makes sense and people use it he searched the whole code base. The only place where they are using blockchain is marketing material. Oh, that's how I kind of feel about it too. Dollar VPN book really got banned from Twitter. Why that? Yeah, just FYI, it's like a parody of the VPN stuff and a parody of like Dollar Shave Club and stuff like this. So, so that's why I'm saying that's the only only one I'm like advertising uh, because it's office. It's like a, a parody thing. If the VP, uh, ISP routing is bad to the game themselves, then the VPN for some reason has more efficient routing. Yes, that's also kind of what I'm imagining, but yeah. All the VPN is tampering with the ping times. Yep. Like, when you connect it to the VPN, they just respond to your pings and fake it. Yeah, that, that, that might actually be the real, the real thing. <laughs> Placebo also works. Yeah, it's... Uh, VPNs are the homeopathy of the internet. To be legally safe, you probably shouldn't say that they don't work at all, but you have to say that they don't work beyond the placebo effect. As far as I know, that's like the thing that you have to say in Germany about homeopathy, otherwise you get sued for defamation. 
but if you say it does it only works uh, no, it doesn't work beyond the placebo effect then that's the scientific truth because the placebo effect has some effect so saying it has no effect is like you know bad but saying whatever okay I keep like clipping away metal parts that they kind of like jump onto this onto these sports I was just waiting for the time where one of these things are just causing a short because you don't really see them uh, there's too much going on on these breadboards <laughs> technical difficulties here savage cut pizza with scissors we won't forget at least I won't yeah and I told you there's a conspiracy and they immediately were onto my tracks and then uh, sabotaged the stream they immediately um, uh, got their DDoS, their DDoS squad uh, attacking me I told you it's all true sometimes it's not the best option it's always the better option what are you talking about I understand wait wait I understand why you do this you just you, you just fear the the agents I understand uh, it's, it's okay it's fine and you we know that they are watching so hello life overflow what's your name didn't you just address me with my name but you can also call me lifey interesting how you write lifey I've been thinking about uh, some some person like tried to jokingly call me lifey thinking they would insult me but I fi figured hey that's a much better name than live overflow but I've been contemplating about how you would write that and I haven't thought about writing lifey as l-i-f-i -I. oh shit <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Sorry for that. I just panicked because of the real life connections that suddenly appeared. <laughs> uh, what that was? Uh, that was a sellout hacker who uh, took over the stream again. Uh, he he keeps disrupting my stream and I can't do anything against it and it sometimes happens <laughs> yeah he's using a VPN he, he's like a step ahead of me because I don't use a VPN you got an old account compromised also by sellout hacker or by somebody else what's the high-pitched noise in the background uh oh uh, to be honest I don't know it could be basically any of these uh, power AC adapters I have here. There's a lot of devices with AC adapters right now in here. Oh yeah, but this is quite significant. Wait, let me figure out what it is. Is this here? Oh yeah, it's the, it's the, uh, wait. Uh. Uh. It's the Canon battery charger. Adversum, adversarial machine learning is so fun. It is always so fascinating how they like just flip like in a couple of pixels in a picture and it's like recognized as a dog and not a cat anymore or whatever. And machine learning works so well and then you see these adversarial machine learning attacks and then you think, oh man, this is all so fucked. I just cramp up my mechanical timer. Well probably feels nice to have arms and fingers to do that yeah you're quite privileged <laughs> the open source local version of Alexa probably just uses the speech to text uh, API from Google anyway it's <laughs> my opinion on trading bots can you refine your question what you mean by that it's a bot that trades I mean it's a bot that trades opinion for what Opinion for you using one, opinion that they that they generally allow to do trading, opinion on the speed of it, opinion on regulations, opinion on if they are worth it, opinion on I for, like it's a bit too general. Uh, this lens is the Canon macro lens. Uh, it's EFS because this is a what's what's the other there's full frame and what's the other one cropped because it's a cropped so macro EFS uh, 35 millimeters okay I do have a compa opinion about computers they are pretty cool there it's less nuanced <laughs> uh, what are you going to do if you fail your masters 
celebrate that I'm done. Well, probably I would try to like uh, do it again or something. It's not really that I met. I don't really care about my masters like too much about failing or passing. Uh, because you know I I have already a job for the past few years, so you know. But also, yeah, correct. There's no failing in a thesis. Like to fail a thesis means I'm not handing it in, basically. Like if if life just turns 180 for whatever reason, or I keep doing this on stream instead of writing thesis, uh, then I might not turn it in. Or it's a plagiarism. Yeah, but that's so lame. Like. I prefer to not hand it in than to plagiarize something. <laughs> it's like the lamest thing you could do. Now we need uh, yellow LEDs. And then we are hopefully almost done. This is the data selector multiplexer. Y4 is an output. This output goes to an LED. Then we have another input A coming from the dip switch input coming from the transceiver and the output Y3 is going to an LED. Now let's move on to the to this chip here just to make sure that there the outputs are connected correctly. This is this chip here. Now this one is pretty simple. Uh, we already know it from other stuff. Should be probably fine. So we have connected VCC, we have connected uh, the direction. Let's see, okay, M and N, I don't know, but they are ground, we can check in a second what they are for. We put them to ground, VCC is over here, the clear is currently not connected, but that was also what Benita mentioned. Up here would be the data in, and then out down here we have the data Q, the data out, starting here, one, two, three, four. Then we have the clock input, G and D, and on the other side we just have uh, the inputs and these G, which I have no clue what it is. So M and N, what is that? Speaking English is tiring. Uh, I guess, I mean, I speak English all day long. So it's nothing out of the ordinary for me. I mean, I guess I don't speak English all day long. I mean, here I'm quite extensively having a conversation and speaking, but... Uh, I think it's more like the amount of speaking at the same time trying to do something. It's just pretty draining. CO2 is level rising, climate change increasing, flooding water at my feet, drowning potential. Okay, well, I cut this wrong earlier, but now it fits perfectly for, uh, for this connection here. We need someone to rewatch the whole stream to confirm the amount of wire count is correct. I think we had actually quite some success today with the uh, thermal camera that it showed us that uh, these XORs. Oh wait, what was the issue earlier? Yeah, yeah, right. That showed us that something was kind of wrong there, and then I noticed that the GND was not correctly correct connected. That was kind of cool. Those hand-shaped com components look shorted. It's heating up so fast. It looks like it's heating up a lot, but look at the temperature scale uh, on the right, like here. Uh, you know, like here, this temperature scale there. Then you see that the minimum temperature is like 26 and the maximum is 32. So these are not really hot. They are just uh, a bit warmer than the surrounding temperature. And so it's noticeable on a thermal camera, but it's actually like not war not even warm to the touch can't really feel it but it would if something was like really getting really really hot we would ex definitely notice it okay so i forgot how this works so this we have the screen led and we have the red led maybe dodgy yeah, yeah okay the clear is just dodgy again uh, so i i must have moved this which then cleared this register because this is directly the output of this register there uh, I mean, we can have a quick look. What is what will be the next stuff for next stream? Uh, it's like the red one, just with eight. So we do that. But there are two videos, so I don't know what else uh, is coming after that. So there are two more par parts after this one. No, wait, wait. Oh no, no, we watched part two. No, we watched part two.
That's the one we are currently watching. Okay, so there's one more part to build the 8-bit one, and then we have a RAM testing and troubleshooting video. Where were the user experience designers of the Google CTF when they designed this? Registration opens, my god. Who cares about when the registration opens? Why is this important? Oh, so it starts like tomorrow night. So basically exactly in 24 hours. Yeah, so I might, so then I will probably stream before it starts and then, then I get off when it starts or something. Like I said, if you play the CTF and uh, attempt some challenges and look at the write-ups afterwards, like on Monday or Saturday, Sunday or so, uh, probably not Sunday, but on Monday or so, we could maybe even chat about it a little bit. Uh, th uh, the Google Capture the Flag is a, like a hacking competition. There will be challenges. If you haven't heard about this before, it might be a little bit hard, but they might also have a beginner's track again. I'm not so sure. I'm not sure about that. Do they write anything about that? Yeah, I know the f FAQ links my videos. It is incredible how many people sent that to me. I rarely get messages about where my videos are linked or mentioned, but this is being sent like multiple times a day to me. They will have beginner quests. Yeah, perfect. Then play some beginner quests or so, or try a harder challenge. It's okay to to not solve them. the The cool thing is that when you spend time on it, you kind of you know you kind of understand a little bit about it, and you might not be able to progress. You get stuck, and then you can look at the write ups. And because you know the challenge, you know it's kind of fun to see and to analyze why you failed and where you got stuck and why you got stuck, and then theorizing about what you could improve that next time you would be able to solve this. So that's quite f a fun experience. So so I, I will do that. Take a couple of hours this weekend, just check it out uh, and basically do that with any CTF as much as you can. To be honest with you, I have been pretty bad about this the past like year or so too. It, too much stuff to do, but I will definitely do this for this CTF. Hopefully see you tomorrow or some other day. Uh, and yeah, bye bye.